I can't believe the semester is almost over. Uh, this is one of our last topics, environmental issues and mold. So some of it's kind of fun, some of it maybe not so much fun. Uh, but you will learn a little bit about some potential environmental hazards in this class, what are disclosure obligations. Uh, we'll touch on some state laws, federal laws, and you know what? It's just good business to um, know a little bit about these potential environmental hazards and what your responsibilities are. So let's begin with asbestos. Asbestos um, was used in building materials. It's fire retardant. And prior to 1978, almost all buildings had some sort of asbestos. Asbestos may be found in ceiling tiles, um, siding, uh, insulation. The problem with asbestos is that, that it's highly friable. In other words, it breaks down over time. And if you breathe it in, it can cause respiratory diseases or exacerbate respiratory diseases. So, for instance, if you've seen ads for mesothelioma, um, mesothelioma in large part is caused by, um, by exposure to asbestos. So it's a, a, incredibly expensive to remove asbestos. Uh, you have to have a, a certified person remove it. In addition, uh, the asbestos has to be uh, dumped in an approved site. For that reason, oftentimes encapsulation is uh, preferred over removal of asbestos. So encapsulation, what is that? Well, we, ha we have a, a lake house in South Carolina that was built in the 1960s, and it has asbestos siding on the outside. How would we encapsulate it? Well, we encapsulate it by covering it with hardy plank siding. That's it. So before the siding, it is not insurable by USAA. They decline to insure it, insure it because of the presence of asbestos. Um, after encapsulation, it's insurable. Again, be careful when you are renovating or when you are remodeling a house. Uh, wear a mask. When in doubt, be very careful about the presence or potential presence of asbestos. It not only could be in ceiling tiles, um, those textured uh, ceilings that people used to use oftentimes have, um, I think they call them popcorn ceilings, oftentimes have asbestos in them. Another potential hazard is uh, lead-based paint. Um, and this causes health concerns primarily in children who eat paint chips uh, or chew on windowsills. Uh, so the health concerns include kidney damage, uh, developmental delay, so, um, and, and problems with red blood cells. Um, lead was used in paints prior to 1978 as a drying agent. It was a very effective drying agent. Um, in terms of disclosure requirements, um, if you are selling a house or if you are leasing a house, you must give the potential lessee or purchaser a, a pamphlet. And the pamphlet is entitled, Protect Your Family from Lead in Your Home. Um, and in practice, you know, what does this matter? Well, it does matter because uh, realty companies have been fined $20,000 for failing to provide this lead-based paint pamphlet to home buyers. Um, there's no federal law that requires that you test for lead-based paint. Um, I think it's fair to assume that if it's an older property, that there's the presence of lead-based paint. Now, if you're purchasing a home and it's an older home, uh, you will be given this disclosure. And not only that, uh, before closing, you will be given um, 10 days to conduct a risk assessment or an inspection for lead-based paints. And you could then cancel the contract if you find that you're not comfortable with the presence of lead-based paint. The EPA has further information, and so if you're interested in looking at uh, one of their publications, you can click on this link. Um, there's potential liability for, um, again, failing to um, give prospective buyers or lessees the pamphlet, but there is no requirement that you test for lead-based paint. Radon. Um, radon is an odorless, colorless gas that's all over. It's a naturally occurring and it occurs as radioactive materials break down. Uh, it really didn't present much of a problem uh, until we became concerned with energy efficient buildings and the buildings were, were made tighter and there was a less air exchange. 
So <clears throat> the only way to know if you have radon in a building is to test for it. And yes, indeed, there's a potential link to lung cancer. So how do you fix it? Well, um, increased ventilation uh, and would reduce uh, radon levels. So here's what I do. I open the windows periodically and let fresh air in. Formaldehyde is another potential environmental hazard that can cause um, breathing problems. It can cause asthma. That's what it does to me. Uh, headaches, uh, nausea. Uh, formaldehyde is, is in some carpeting, uh, paneling, and some other building products, um, including insulation. It's a major contributor to sick building syndrome. So uh, for me, if I walk in a building and it's present, I can tell immediately. And of course, I would not want to buy that property um, if, that's, if that's the case. But anyway, it's colorless uh, chemical. It's widely used in building materials. Just be aware that that could be the cause of a major problem. All right, now on to mold. Get to the fun stuff. Um, Liability of licensees. So um, licensees have been held liable for the presence of mold. So if you know it's present, you need to disclose. There are no federal disclosure requirements, but again, you would not want to hide the presence of, of uh, mold. So failing to disclose could present some legal problems to you if you happen to be a real estate licensee. All right, so I just put together this slide. So who's being sued? Almost everybody, right? Building owners, condo associations, building managers, school boards, architects, engineers, realtors for non-disclosure and contractors. Um, at some point, you may see yourself on the list. I certainly hope not. So the increasing number of mold cases has been fueled by one case out of Texas, and it's Ballard, the Ballard case. This is a case where um, a homeowner purchased a, a house for $275,000, there were water leaks, pinhole-sized water leaks in the water pipes in the house <coughs> that caused major mold problems. And uh, the insurance company declined to um, cover the remediation. Anyway, in this case, the homeowner sued, and a judgment was rendered for $32 million. It was at that point that the American Trial Lawyers Association began running mold remediation and mold cases, how to sue uh, for the presence of mold. Um, so full disclosure, I took one of those classes. I have not sued anyone, nor do I plan to sue anyone, but I wanted to know more about mold. All right, so here's some of the drivers. Um, uh, 2020 had a, a story on it, CNN. Uh, Kingsmill Resort here in Virginia closed about 400 units because of mold remediation. Uh, Hilton Hotels closed a hotel in, in Hawaii to remediate mold. Um, some other people have brought some high profile people have brought some mold cases. And here's some of the judgments that have been um, recovered. So how about um, personal injury claims? So you say you can recover for damage to the property. What about damage to your person? Well, it's somewhat difficult uh, because you have to prove medical causation. And so there really is not a set dose response uh, to mold. So it's a little bit difficult to prove. However, I will say that there's certain types of mold that if they are present, then they produce these things called mycotoxins. And this is what would make a person ill. Stachybotrys is top of the list. That's black mold. You've probably heard about it. Aspergillus, penicillium, tychoderma, fusarium, and the, the health implications can be serious. What's the status of mold litigation in Virginia? Do we have any cases? Yes, of course, we've had some mold cases. Um, so uh, there were a series of cases that were related to um, synthetic stucco that was being used on the outside of buildings without a water um, vapor barrier. Um, some of the factors that affect mold claims in Virginia, a couple of them are that, uh, number one, we have a cap on punitive damages. And um, <coughs> in addition to a cap on punitive damages, and, and the cap is, is 
relatively um, low, it, certainly not anywhere near the $32 million. Our punitive damages cap, the last I looked, was, I believe, $350,000. Also in Virginia, it's very difficult to recover attorney's fees, and court costs can mount up very quickly. And then the third reason that we haven't seen a whole lot of mold cases in Virginia is that we do not recognize class actions. The Virginia Residential Landlord and Tenant Act, the law that we discussed previously, um, does require the landlord to disclose the presence of mold. And tenant, if you, you have the right to terminate the tenancy if there is the presence of mold. All right, so I don't mean just a little bit of black mold in your shower. You need to clean that. Just get out the comet or whatever you use and clean that off. Um, <clears throat> but you also have certain duties. If there's water intrusion, you need to let the landlord know right away. Minimizing the risk of mold claims, number one on the list is eliminate moisture. Always disclose, never try to hide the presence of mold to purchasers. Um, sellers who know of, of hidden defects have the duty to disclose. And what about a prior mold problem? Again, remediate and disclose. Here's some fun facts. Mold is a type of a fungus. Um, it can appear as a stain, a smudge, a discoloration, a musty sort of a smell. It needs a water source to grow. Without a water source, it cannot grow. Um, mold is all around us. So as I said, it's out in the dirt in front of uh, Heiner right now. It plays an important role in the decaying process. Penicillin is a mold. Cheese is a mold. But a few varieties have been linked to serious health problems. So again, determine the source of moisture and fix it. That's step number one. Do not hide it. So if you really needed to, you could test air quality for mold. You could test building materials for mold. You could do surface sampling. Again, don't forget interstitial spaces. So having been through a Cat 5 hurricane, and ha ha we've had to tear out all of the walls in our house and, and the floors as well. So remember, once things are torn out, you need to let everything dry thoroughly. And treat, be proactive, and treat for mold before it appears. Any porous materials um, that have mold, you need to tear out. So there are some standards, but there are no state standards. OSHA has some general standards um, about the presence of mold. New York City does. The EPA has some commercial standards, but there aren't any that are set in stone in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Here's some simple actions. I don't know if you realize this or not, but for porous surfaces, the way you would treat mold is not with bleach. You would use a, a combination of white vinegar and hydrogen peroxide and spray them on and let things dry. Uh, again, if it's a serious mold problem, you're going to have to hire um, a professional to come in and spray. In my experience, has been it's a two-step process. For non-porous materials, you can use uh, water and bleach. So 10 to 1, water to bleach. Um, a bleach, let me caution you, is toxic. Make sure that you use it in a well-ventilated area and be careful with using bleach. So again, larger amounts of, of mold uh, require a bigger response. So you may need to hire a professional. Be careful with whom you hire. Make sure they are truly a mold professional uh, with proper training and experience. Insurance isn't going to cover mold. Um, Non-pollution policies generally do not cover mold. Um, moisture control, again, is the key to controlling mold. All right, so what are some other things you need to be aware of? Groundwater. So if you purchase a property that has a well and you're going to be dependent on that well, make sure that you test for, for not only uh, organic materials but for inorganic materials. So. Uh, I don't know if you realize this or not, but the EPA estimates that 40% of underground storage tanks are leaking. 
So let's say you buy a house in the country. This is your dream house. And you're right next door to a country store that has uh, gas pumps. You should have your groundwater. You should have your well checked for both organic and inorganic substances. So just another few things for you to know that federal law requires underground storage tanks. Those are tanks that, that store at least 10% of their volume underground. Um, they have to be registered. So there's certain t exemptions, um, underground storage tanks, that do not have to be registered. So for instance, a tank that holds less than 110 gallons, or one that's used for farm and residential uh, uses that hold up to 1,100 gallons don't have to be registered. Tanks that store heating oil burned on the premises and septic tanks also do not have to be registered. Um, let's look at a, an environmental protection statute. The Comprehensive Environmental Response and Liability Act is also known as CERCLA. And uh, CERCLA identified certain places as being Superfund sites. And if you are the owner or a former owner or even a lessee of a Superfund site, you have the potential for liability for cleaning up that site. And liability is joint, that means together, several, separate, um, and retroactive. And we're going to go over a case in just a minute that illustrates what I mean by this. So how do you protect yourself from uh, inadvertently purchasing a property that is later identified as a Superfund site? Well, the way you do your due diligence is that you can do a phase one environmental site assessment. In other words, an expert comes in, tests the soil, looks, uh, and if you do a, a phase one site assessment and it does not show the presence of hazardous waste, then you're insulated from liability on down the road. All right, so here's the case. Jim Wilson, <coughs> 30 years ago, owned a car wash in Monterey, California. So what did he do that was wrong? Well, at the time, soapy water was um, <coughs> ran into the dump at, at Monterey. In the 1960s, it was not illegal to do this. And now, just recently, he's received a bill because the, the Monterey dump has been um, identified as an EPA Superfund site. He's been sent a bill for $142,000. That would have been his share uh, for his car wash. Now, he wants to know what to do. As I said earlier, um, liability is joint, several, and retroactive. He said, I haven't owned that car wash in years. In fact, I've, I've totally forgot that I ever owned it. Do I owe the bill? Well, the answer is, yeah, you probably do. If he declines to pay the bill that was sent to him in the mail, then he could be liable for the entire cleanup of, in this project. It was $600 million, which surely will bankrupt Jim Wilson. All right, as a result of CERCLA, though, um, what we saw was that there were certain old industrial sites in cities, and even Farmville had some old industrial sites, shoe factories, um, that no one wanted to develop. In fact, no one wanted to own them because they, didn't, they wanted to avoid that potential liability. So these brownfields were given a special status. And the special status was to encourage the development of these abandoned properties. So you'll see some of them in Richmond. And so these, uh, the designation as being a brownfield uh, would shield an innocent developer <coughs> from liability for cleanup. NEPA, or the National Environmental Policy Act, a NEPA mandates that certain new projects have to consider the impact on the environment. So I picked this case, I thought it was kind of interesting, uh, Chinese Staff and Workers Association versus the City of New York. So this is a picture of, of Chinatown in New York City. And there was a proposed luxury high-rise, and it was to be built right in the middle of Chinatown. And so the question for the court was this, is an environmental impact statement required for this project? And the answer, of course, is yes. So it does affect the environment. It affects the living environment for the people who lived in that area. All right, so that's about it for environmental law and mold. And um, you take care. Thanks.